So today I'd like to talk a little bit about chapter five, nonverbal influence. So today we're going to go over nonverbal communication and how it's used in a number of factors of human communication. <clears throat> First we have to talk about how important is it, and it's very important. So arguably nonverbal communication has been studied even longer than verbal communication. Uh, we've always been trying to gauge each other's postures, and going all the way back to the days of Darwin, uh, he's done tons and tons of research even looking at animal posturing and nonverbal communication. It's a very, very multidisciplinary function. Uh, people in sociology, anthropology, communication, everybody seems to have a hand in the wide world of nonverbal communication, looking at it from different cultural perspectives, from gendered perspectives, uh, trying to analyze if there are, in fact, universal forms of nonverbal communication, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But what does it do in general? Well, first of all, we know that we use nonverbal communication in a number of ways to keep our impressions uh, formulated well in front of other individuals. So we first of all try and shape our impressions towards other individuals with nonverbal communication. This could be attire, look, dress, fashion, all these things. Uh, we could try and use it to enhance our perceived attractiveness, our credibility, or even our status in front of other individuals that are around us. We also use nonverbal communication to establish rapport with other people. So how close we are to another person oftentimes can convey immediacy, uh, rapport, or even uh, intimacy with other individuals, depending on how close you really get. <laughs> uh, but issues of touch, smiling, eye contact, all these nonverbal behaviors all establish some kind of rapport or increase the immediacy between a particular speaker and the person that they're talking to. Now, inside of the functions of nonverbal communication, we see, see that it serves a number of communicative functions. First of all, uh, it facilitates or inhibits attention between two other people. We talked earlier a little bit about how inside of a, a typical dyadic or interpersonal conversation, usually two people are talking, the listener is giving more eye contact than the speaker, and usually what happens is as the speaker is talking around, eventually brings the eye contact back to the listener, and at that moment in time, it's sort of a turn take, if you will, uh, giving someone the, uh, the expectation that it's now their turn to talk. Uh, we also see that you know, we can facilitate or inhibit attention with distractions uh, de designed to decrease attention through nonverbal communication forms or by decreasing distractions by having a, a, a more direct nonverbal communication style, we can increase or facilitate attention between two people that are speaking. Uh, we also notice that nonverbal communication can model behavior. It works as social proof. So, for example, putting on a seatbelt uh, in front of another person uh, gives them sort of a nonverbal cue that they should put on a seatbelt as well. There's a lot of interesting research that we'll talk about later on with regards to mirroring, that some people tend to mirror nonverbal behaviors to increase in intimacy with each other. Uh, we just talked about how eye contact works as turn taking, but oftentimes, you know, we can see closed versus open body postures also facilitate communication between other individuals or that it's your turn to speak at some given point in time. Even things like raising your hand in, in an old school classroom <laughs> uh, might give you a, a signal to a turn take in a particular situation. And then, of course, finally, nonverbal communication violates other people's expectations. So there's, even though there are a few universals inside of the wide world of nonverbal communication, we do know when a social norm is broken. So if somebody stands too close to you, especially now in this socially distant era, uh, if someone stands too close to you, oftentimes this can create anger or frustration in a number of areas uh, because we have nonverbal norms, uh, proxemic boundaries, bubbles that oftentimes feel as if have been burst by somebody becoming too close to us. Now, in general, uh, most communication researchers out there sort of follow what Anderson says. So he talks about the direct effects model of immediacy. So pretty much usually nonverbal communication facilitates immediacy between two people. So oftentimes nonverbally we feel close to another person because we physically feel close to them. So warm, involving, immediate behavior. So you know, giving people hugs, moving in closer towards them, smiles, uh, all these types of warm nonverbal communication oftentimes enhance the persuasiveness of any particular message. So anytime somebody's up, you know, trying to give a speech, if you tend to be warm, inviting, close, open body, these things all tend to enhance the persuasiveness of what you're trying to say in front of a larger audience. Because 
quite simply, as we go back to chapter two and those notions of proximity, that it's easier to comply with people who we like, right? So if we find them to be likable individuals, we're gonna li listen to them more, we tend to trust them more, we see them as being friendly, we don't have our defenses up immediately. So nonverbal communication oftentimes facilitates persuasion by inviting people in to your level of argumentation while giving a speech. So when we talk about nonverbal communication today, it's going to be a lot of these icks, right? So we're going to go over oculics, we're going to go over haptics, we're going to go over proxemics, we're going to go over kinesics. There's a lot of these sort of Latin phrases that kind of get pulled in. Uh, the first, of course, is oculix or oculix, uh, depending on who you ask at whatever particular moment in time. Or even some people might refer to it as oculesics, I've seen before too. But uh, these go back to a bunch of 1940s and 1950s studies where they're trying to figure out how much communication is in the eyes, right? So even if Shakespeare said the eyes are the windows to the soul, yeah, some of these original studies were trying to figure out, well, can you actually tell uh, a significant difference between people with regards to their eye contact? Now, I know this is probably pretty hard to see in a video format, but this is one of those classic 1950s studies where they took the exact same picture and they just made one small change. In this particular situation, they dilated her eyes. So if you take a look at these two different uh, photographs that you have up here, you can see that this person over here on your right, I guess, <laughs> uh, has dilated eyes versus just sort of a regular, uh, a regular face on the other side. They oftentimes ask students, you know, or ask other people, subjects inside of these psychological studies, what did you see? And, and though the results on attractiveness weren't really necessarily that much higher, they did oftentimes gauge her as being more engaged, more immediate, closer towards me, more likable, though not necessarily more attractive. So we do find that pupil dilation does seem to convey a, an interest in another person, uh, especially when we can take a look at it, you know, really, <laughs> well, I guess you folks probably can't, but if you take a look at it really closely. Uh, we also do see that pupil dilation is uh, tied into things like lying, uh, tied into high psychological strain, conversations, these kinds of things. You know, it kind of goes back to that old fight or flight response with regards to pupil dilation. But eye contact in general has been the subject of a number of different studies. And to kind of go over these, we're going to talk a lot about Chris Segrin. Uh, he's over at Arizona State University and does a lot of what we call meta-analyses, where he takes a look at a series of studies inside of the wide world of nonverbal communication, and then sort of creates a gigantic, uh, sort of an overarching uh, correlation, or if there's any kind of a larger effect size. Uh, after he looked at 12 studies with regards to eye contact, he pretty much finds that eye contact enhances persuasion, right? So if you're giving people more eye contact inside of real life, they feel an obligation to give you eye contact and attention back in a significant way. Even through, you know, these little Zoom lectures that we've had, the eye contact that you give another speaker actually does have some kind of small effect for those of you folks that had to speak a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we do see, quoting uh, Segrin, that gaze produced greater compliance than gaze aversion in every single one of the 12 studies that he took a look, to, look at going up to 1993. And pretty much across all the major studies, with maybe the exception of one, uh, we do see that if we have gaze, if we're staring at somebody, it tends to increase our persuasibility towards the other individual because it commands attention. Uh, if you folks have probably gone through your lives or your, <laughs> back in the day when you used to drive down to campus and you're coming off the 91 freeway, uh, oftentimes you probably see panhandlers and you'll notice one of the first things they try to do from their sign is try and grab eye contact with you, trying to stare in so they can get an eye contact moment with you because tons of research shows that if you establish eye contact first, compliance gaining will come afterwards. So a lot of panhandlers, of course, try to establish eye contact before they try and get you to give them a couple of extra bucks. Uh, speakers who are, avoid eye contact, so you know when we put up students or put up videos to students that show speakers who are looking down or to the side a lot, uh, people who avoid eye, con eye contact are oftentimes perceived as less credible. The only exception that I found out of all the research that I've read with regards to nonverbal communication and eye contact is that if you're making an illegitimate request, so a request that's so over the top that you're probably not going to get it in the first place. Uh, it tends to be more effective without eye contact. So, you know, if you're asking your mom for, you know, a thousand dollars or something like that, you almost show deference by, you know, putting eye contact to the side. And we do see a small increase uh, without eye contact, especially if it's completely illegitimate or something that you're probably not going to get in the first place. 
The second major area where we see a lot of research is in the world of facial expressions. So this goes back to Paul Ekman, as we talked about in chapter four. He's done a lot of research on deception detection, and he's actually the first major researcher inside of psychology to figure out, are there in fact universal facial expressions? So in the 1970s, Ekman went around uh, trying to ask different cultures, different people. He would show pictures of faces, and he'd ask them, you know, what is the word for this face in your particular culture? He'd translate it and try and figure out if there were similarities across different cultures that were out there. And in fact, he did this study across the entire world. So he would go, you know, to Japan and ask somebody, hey, is, what does this smile look like to you? And they'd say it's a smile. You come to people in America, what is this expression? Oh, it's happiness expressed by a smile. Anywhere he went in the entire world, a smile was always a smile. Curiously enough, he actually went down all the way to the pre-literate tribes of Papua New Guinea, where people hadn't even been contacted by, uh, by any kind of technological society. Pre-literate, they didn't really even have uh, a unified language, but rather just sort of regional dialects. And he would still show a picture of this to some of the tribal captains, and they would tell a story that sort of reflected happiness. Like, this looks like a guy who just got a great hunt for the day, or something along those lines. Uh, so even in a pre-literate tribe, we still saw that a smile was in fact a smile. And as Ekman went on, he kind of found that there was pretty much a lot of justification for, for about seven different universal facial expressions, six of which are represented up here. Uh, first, of course, we have anger. Uh, sort of, this is the uh, straight-lipped anger. Now, of course, anger can also be that square tooth rage that you can have towards somebody. But across the board, if anybody has the eyes that come down that sort of narrowed, peaked outside, uh, it's an anger expression. Uh, we have fear. Uh, fear, of course, being one of those universal facial expressions. You can always tell when somebody's scared. As a matter of fact, this is a picture of Paul Ekman himself. Uh, disgust. Disgust is a curious facial expression in the fact that not only is it universal among all humans, but even animals can recognize disgust in humans. So when you look disgusted to your dog, they know that you're disgusted. And oftentimes you can probably tell when your dog is disgusted too, by how they jerk away and wrinkle their nose at you. Uh, we also have surprise, which is close to fear, but surprise has a couple of different uh, aspects, especially with regards to the mouth. Uh, happiness, of course recognizable by 99.99999% of the world's population. And of course, sadness, uh, actually getting those eyebrows to come in and go up and, and that sort of droopy feel uh, is another universal facial expression that not only has a, a, an external focus that everybody can recognize, but also has an internal uh, response to yourself as well. We talked a little bit about emotional contagion, that just the mere action of smiling increases your heart rate, increases your galvanic skin response. The same thing is true of sadness, that if you try to make yourself look sad, and actually if you folks want to try this, when you go, you know, while you're at home right now, if you have a few minutes, look into a mirror and see if you can make yourself sad. It is so hard to be able to get your eyebrows to go in and up and, and give that genuine sad uh, without you actually feeling sad, that your facial expressions are hardwired to your body and uh, your galvanic skin response goes down, your skin gets colder, your heart rate goes down. There are real biological implications for the types of facial expressions that you use in everyday life. So in 1980, Eggman kind of publishes his final results. And uh, if you want the seven universal facial expressions, you want to make sure you probably have these down in your notes. Uh, it all goes by the acronym SADFISH. So sadness, anger, disgust, fear, interest. And interest is somewhat debatable because interest isn't really much of a facial expression. It's pretty much just raising your eyebrows and kind of just showing attention towards another individual. But Eggman argues that it's universal, and his data does show that. Uh, of course, surprise, and finally, happiness. So the six that we just talked about earlier with the addition of interest, which is kind of just opening up your eyes towards somebody to show that you're attentive to them. Now, uh, I did a lot of research on smiles back when I was doing my master's thesis in nonverbal communication, and some very interesting studies that are out there. So the smile, of course, is the most universally recognized facial expression, uh, and, this, and he makes the argument for it back in 1980. All the data has shown that smiles are always smiles everywhere you go. Uh, it can be recognized at intensity levels as low as 20%. So I can take a smile and Photoshop it all the way down to 20%, just a really small, slight smile. And you'll still detect the fact that it is a smile. And curiously enough, uh, there are a couple of these very interesting studies that uh, talk about how the brain cognitively fills in perceptual characteristics. 
So you can have somebody standing 200 feet away from you, and you'll be able to kind of make out, you know, their body frame, their type, you know, male versus female, uh, but you won't be able to make up too much of their face. You know, you won't be able to figure out, you know, the, how large their nose is or, or where their eyes are looking at, but you will be able to detect them if they smile. This is a, a series of these studies uh, that, you know, they take farther distance objects and then they compare them to photographs and they try and figure out whether or not human brains are filling it in. The classic of these is moon studies. So people would take you out at night and have you look up at the moon and then they'd show you a picture from a camera of that exact same moon. And you physically see the moon larger. Evolutionary biologists and evolutionary psychologists uh, justify this by saying since the moon was so important for us back in our quote unquote hunter gatherer stages of evolution that we even to this day see the moon as larger than it really is. The same thing is true arguably from an evolutionary hypothesis that uh, the smile of course being a, a non-threatening symbol is something that we are able to pick up on easier than other types of facial expressions out there. So even at 200 feet, we're able to detect if somebody's smiling at us because of you know, arguably a fight or flight response that's been ingrained into us ever since we were young and evolutionarily lower on the hierarchy. Uh, so while I was doing my research on facial expressions back in the day, there was a, we had to go back and find the quote unquote foundational text. So one of the very first texts that was ever written with regards to facial expressions was by this guy named Duchamp, the Mécanisme du Facial Expression, uh, back in the 1850s. And uh, so this is at a time, you know, where where we're not necessarily uh, <laughs> opening people up or looking at cadavers to try and figure out exactly what's going on with facial muscles. And electricity is getting really cool, right? So, um, so while he's doing these studies, he's trying to figure out, well, what muscles, because the face has so many muscles, right? We have zygomatis major, orbicularis oculi. We have the corrugator group. We have hundreds of muscles inside of the face. And he's trying to figure out which ones actually do contribute to these universal facial expressions or all the facial expressions that we've seen. So supposedly, this guy was a homeless man in France who had drank so much that he couldn't feel anything in his face. I don't really know though, man. But uh, Duchamp eventually hooked him up to a bunch of these electrodes to try and isolate different muscle pairs and then would take photographs to try and just justify which actual muscle groups contained every one of these facial expressions. And uh, so in this particular situation, he's trying to acti activate the zygomatis major muscle, right? The primary smiling muscle that pulls your lips you know, up and to the sides, and finds that just activating these alone doesn't create a true smile. It just creates the average sort of, you know, lip curling that we think is a smile, but most people will call a fake smile. In fact, he finds that for a true smile or a felt smile to be ha ha you have to have the contraction of what's known as the orbicularis oculi muscles as well. So a true smile is, in fact, not only a pulling back by the zygomatis major, but also a contraction of the orbicularis oculi. And to this day, you know, a true or felt smile is oftentimes referred to as the Duchamp smile due to his work back in the 1850s. Now, as far as smiling goes, there's been a lot of effect studies that have been done inside of the field of psychology and communication. So uh, we find that food servers who smile at their customers oftentimes receive larger tips. Pretty easy experimental design, right? You have a food server one night smiling at everybody and the same person not smiling, and then you do it across a bunch of different individuals, you find out that on average, if you're smiling more, you're gonna eventually get higher tips than someone who's not smiling. Uh, we do see the job applicants are, are oftentimes rated more favorably if they are smiling during their interview. So next time you go for that job, make sure you smile. Uh, we find that cheaters who smiled were uh, received more lenient treatment. So, you know, in those uh, videotaped rooms where cheaters are talking to their principals or, or, you know, people are getting caught for plagiarism or these kinds of things, that smiling in these particular studies, and heck, man, he's a great researcher too, uh, actually uh, were received leaner, lean, more lenient treatments as opposed to people who did not smile. And then finally, uh, one of these quote unquote third person studies. So there's a lot of these third person effect studies where you have a confederate come into an equation. So you have somebody come and do one communicative behavior to an individual, and then afterwards it's followed up by a second individual who asks for something. So after being smiled at, people were more likely to help a third person that's out there. So I walk up and just kind of give you a smile and a wave. And as I walk off the camera, another person comes in and then asks you for a favor. And you're more likely to do that favor because you already have sort of an emotional spillover from the person smiling beforehand. 
So that takes us through the wide world of facial expressions and the universality of some of them. Uh, next, there's a lot of interesting research done on what we call kinesics or body movement. So for those of you folks that may have a friend or have taken a kinesiology class that has to deal with the physical education of body movement, the same thing holds true inside of the world of communication. We're dealing with body movement through space and all the studies that have been happening inside of the world of kinesics. I don't know if you folks kind of remember from about like seven, eight years ago, there was a big gigantic meme running around about the dancing figure that's spinning back and forth. When in fact, she's not really spinning, it's actually a reversed image that goes back and forth and makes up an optical illusion. Now, uh, with regards to kinesics or body movement, uh, there's a lot of research done on what we call mirroring. So we do find that people who have similar body movements and similar body expressions, hand gestures, openness versus closeness, are perceived as more likable than individuals who have contrary body movements. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to do the exact same thing, right? Like if you give finger guns to somebody and they give you finger guns back, you're suddenly brothers for life. No, but oftentimes if a person tends to be more open and you communicate with more of an open body posture, then that's going to enhance the likability. There's also some research that shows that if you mirror, so if one person crosses this way, the other person crosses that way, that that type of mirroring is if you're looking into a mirror does facilitate persuasion in a number of ways as well. So there is some research where they've had interviewers who were trained to actually go in and then the interviewee would mimic or mirror the actual body posture of another person while they were inside of the interview and they found that they were in fact rated higher. So remembering, of, of course, involves matching or mimicking another person's body movements, eye contact, posture, gestures, these kinds of things. And because we tend to mirror those types of nonverbal behaviors, it does seem to convey similarity or empathy. A lot of this research were, was done by two amazing researchers back in around 19, the late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, they were over at NYU and considered to be the, the first leading pioneering researchers on what's referred to as automaticity. Uh, and they did a lot of these studies with these immediate sort of perception checks where I would just do something that was subtle and immediate and did it actually leave a, a lasting influence on your mind. And uh, they did find that nonverbal mimicry facilitates persuasion. So if I tend to use similar and mirrored types of body movements as you, I'm more likely to have a persuasive message come across as stronger to you than if I'm giving you an opposite type of you know, maybe closed body, looking down, not giving you the types of eye contact and facial expressions that you would give back to me. So interesting research done by these guys. Uh, really wrapped up pretty well in uh, a book called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. So hand gestures, you know, one of the hardest things for us to do inside of this Zoom world, right? How is it that I can get a right camera shot that allows me to use hand gestures and to facilitate my persuasive message? Well, again, uh, a lot of research has been done on what are hand gestures, what are they in fact, are there some that are universal, are there some that uh, work across all situations. You know, every time we have a president, they always seem to have some kind of hand gesture and everybody's trying to analyze what that hand gesture actually is. So way back in the days of Bill Clinton, people used to always wonder if his little thumb thing that he used to do was in fact increasing persuasion since he wasn't pointing at people, but he was kind of giving you the thumb every time he talked to you. Uh, I, I just got done reading an article actually where they were talking about the, the Trumps thing uh, where he does the little sort of circles up by his eyes. Uh, and then of course we got Bernie, right? Let me tell you something. <laughs> there are numbers of different hand gestures out there. And every time somebody comes out to see with one, it seems like there are 20 different researchers that are trying to figure out whether or not it means anything. Now, there is a lot of variability inside of the wide world of hand gestures. You know, most of the research shows that if you're fluid with them, if they tend to come along with your message and seem natural, then it tends to facilitate persuasion. But there are some specific studies. The first, of course, are what we call emblems, right? So emblems have very precise verbal meaning. So inside of every culture, there are usually a handful of facial expressions that are codes, if you will, right? That, that we can communicate towards other individuals that are out there, and, and it has a very precise meaning. Not necessarily universal, usually culturally specific, but has a meaning in and of itself. So if I was to give you folks something like the peace sign, odds are you, know, you probably would recognize it as a peace sign. However, you know, maybe back in the 1950s, the peace sign was a victory sign for people trying to, you had just gotten out of the war. Um, also, in addition to that, right, if I take that same peace sign and throw it in with an elbow, you know, it's a curse word if we go to British culture. 
But we do see that almost all the time, you know, there's something very unique and something that has a direct verbal meaning that can be attached to that one type of, of hand gesture. Uh, same thing goes with shush, right? So if I was to give you a shh kind of look, odds are you know almost exactly what that kind of uh, hand gesture means. Shame on you uh, probably has a, a very culturally, well, culturally, you know, universal kind of statement that's out there. Uh, come over here, uh, oftentimes, is, you know, could be interpreted as having its own precise verbal meaning. And then, of course, zip it, right? Zip it. <laughs> now, curiously enough, right, we do see that there are some emblematic hand gestures that have completely radical different interpretations depending upon context. One of my favorite, of course, is the infamous A-OK -okay symbol, right? So everything was supposed to be A-OK. -okay. However, I'm sure lots of you folks played this game back in the day, right? Can you get below my belt here? Uh, and curiously enough, more recently, right, people doing the white power sign uh, with the same sort of P look or something like that, or the WP that's supposed to be coming out of that. So it is emblematic. It does have precise verbal communication, but it can be contextualized based around culture or time. Now, for most of you folks in this class, you know, you're really trying to use hand gestures to illustrate or accompany your particular speech. So oftentimes we use illustrative hand gestures to add a little extra nonverbal flair to what we're saying verbally, right? So I love you this much, right? Or I caught a fish this big. <laughs> Or maybe if we went small too, right, you can just use a little pinch of something, you know, a very small amount uh, can be illustrated or accompanied with the speech that I'm giving you. Now research does show that if you use gestures freely, uh, it tends to add to your persuasibility uh, or to your persuasive message. So yes, of course, if you give a speech with your arms folded the entire time, odds are it's not going to enhance your persuasibility while giving that particular speech. And people tend to remember the gestures that you add on to your speech more so, and even better than actual words that are out there. Or at least that's what Bernstein argues back in 1994. Now finally, there's sort of a third category of hand gestures. And this goes back to a lot of debate as to whether or not you know, folding your arms is always a closed form of communication, right? So you know, back in the day in the 70s, you know, uh, it all comes from this guy Julius Faust who wrote a book it's called How to Read Women Like a Book, right? Where he said there was all these hand gestures and body movements that you could instantaneously interpret. And he, he was soundly uh, <laughs> disproven over the course of time. But uh, we do find that sometimes maybe closing your arms isn't necessarily that I'm closed off to you communicatively. I might just be cold. So this leads us into the like, last sort of category of hand gestures, so what we refer to as adapters. Adapters are unintentional cues that signal negative feelings or you're adapting to a particular situation. You could be adapting to the cold of a room. You could be adapting to a highly nervous public speaking moment, uh, these kinds of things. And so things like lip biting or nail biting or hand wringing or hair twirling, all might be you adapting to a stressful environment in a particular situation. Or it might be, you know, uh, any other ways of, of adapting to a particular situation. I don't know, maybe hand wringing to remind yourself that you need to wash your hands after all this COVID stuff. <laughs> Who knows, right? Uh, adapters in general tend to convey uh, internal states, and a lot of times people try to read into these as well. So they can convey issues like boredom or nervousness, anxiety or stress, or even a lack of composure. But remember, of course, you know that these studies are very probabilistic, right? So it's not always that just because you're engaging in that particular adaptive behavior that you suddenly obviously are bored or nervous, but rather they tend to be inclinations and audiences tend to perceive them that way. So oftentimes we want to make sure that we're not engaging in those types of hand gestures. The next area, so, so far we've talked about proximity, or we've talked about kinesics, we've talked about facial expressions, we've talked about oculics. Uh, the next area that we're going to talk about here is the notion of haptics. Uh, so, the studies of touch, right? So, touch is the oldest form of human communication. I mean, I'm sure before we even learned language, you know, mothers would still touch their young. Uh, before we even learned, you know, how to read other people's hand signals, uh, we would still probably touch each other as a form of immediacy. And I'm sure for those of you folks that have animals, right, it's the primary means by which you communicate with your animals, right? You pet them, you hold them, you squeeze them, you love them, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
most of the research on touch tends to see, well, it tends to show what we call the Midas touch, right? That in general, unless it's inappropriate, right, more touch tends to enhance or facilitate compliance gaining. Now, of course, the times are changing, right? Uh, but still, for the most part, if you are with a friend and you're touching them on a shoulder or something like that, you know, these are going to be situations that's going to enhance your, your level of persuasibility towards other individuals. But on the other hand, right, an inappropriate touch has the most severe punishments with it, which may be more argument for why touch is such a powerful form of nonverbal communication. So of course, it's a study I've done all the way back in the 1980s, so I don't know how much food servers are still touching uh, customers that are out there. But uh, they did find that you know, touching somebody lightly on the shoulder while handing them the check facilitated or, hit, or created uh, larger tips, right? So if I, you know, hey, hon, here you go, here's your bill, right? Like, like a typical 1980s waitress or waiter would say, uh, you, you tend to receive larger tips. Remember, of course, this is always situational. We'll talk a little bit about expectancy violations theory in a second. And the key aspect here is that touch must always be perceived as appropriate in location, duration, and intensity. So times are changing. There are social normative standards around here. I'm not advocating that you go out and just start randomly touching people. But if you do it appropriately, you know, going in for a second hand around a handshake, or maybe even touching somebody's elbow, or even a light pat on the shoulder as you're doing a handshake, or for those of you folks, you know, with people that you are friendly with, you know, your, your good friends, your family going in for a hug after that handshake increases your persuasibility, your immediacy, your attachment to the other individual. So here's another one of those classic third person studies, right? So uh, a person asks a stranger to, to watch a big, huge, unruly dog, right? So picture, you know, you've got a big German shepherd or, you know, <laughs> uh, some kind of Great Dane or something like that. And the uh, other person says, hey, can you, can you just watch my dog for a second? I just got to run in and use the bathroom. Or I got to run in and go to a bank for a second. Uh, so if a person touches you, right, or gives you a, a small touch, hey, can you do me a favor? 55% uh, of subjects who were touched consented to this particular study. And then, of course, uh, if you didn't touch, only 35% consented to looking over this big, unruly dog. So in these particular studies, you know, you're, you're adding an extra sort of layer, uh, a stimulus, if you will, and then asking for a compliance-seeking behavior. And then we find that, you know, touch, of course, I mean, a 20% difference in a 2000 study is pretty significant uh, for, for asking somebody for a favor like watching a dog for 10 minutes. Uh, as far as haptics goes, again, Chris Segrin over here did a bunch of meta-analyses looking at the different studies on touch, and he finds of over the 13 that he looked at in this particular article, touch always produces as much and in many cases more compliance to no touch when all other things are created equal, so are held equal. So when we control for all other variables and we just take out the only uh, the aspect of touch, we do see that it tends to facilitate and increase levels of compliance gain. So haptics, you know, I, if times are changing, right? Maybe I should update some of my research. But, but I do think that, you know, if we do have the appropriate types of touch that are out there, we can increase it. So, I mean, obviously Joe Biden's coming to mind, right? You know, you probably shouldn't go around and start giving people massages and sniffing their hair. But we do find that, that generally appropriate touch tends to facilitate compliance gaining. The next area that I want to talk about, and there's been lots of studies about this, is this notion of proxemics. Uh, so this is geographical space. Uh, all this stuff goes back to a bunch of research done by Edward T. Hall. So in 1948, he writes a book called The Territorial Imperative, talking about how we as human beings tend to have issues of space, much like animals do, right? We're always big fight or flight responses. Someone's too close to me and it gets us all stressed out, or someone's really far away from us and we're sort of gauging them to see whether or not we want to interact with them more. But all this comes down to a number of sociological studies that he does back in the 40s and the 50s that deal with issues of proxemics. So geographical closeness increases liking, increases attention. When we talked about chapter two, the original studies done by Zions, you know, at Stanford University, turns out that people that were closer to the walkways or the entryways to the dorms tended to be more likable because people just saw them more. They were closer to them for longer periods and points in times during the day. Uh, <laughs> when we ever get back into a classroom, uh, usually when we do studies over the course of a class, you know, you'll find that people that sit on the same side of the room as you, you tend to like more than people who sit farther away on the other side of the room. You've just had more interactions with them in significant kinds of ways. 
And this all comes down to uh, a perceived similarity. So geographical closeness involves cultural variables, right? So you know, if anybody's you know spent significant times outside of Southern California, you'll know that people may have very serious stereotypes about Southern Californians, right? We all say, "Dude," <laughs> we're all laid back, we're all super attractive, right? Of course, right? <laughs> uh, but we have perceived similarities. So people in our geographic region tend to have similarities. We perceive ourselves to have similarities. I don't know, everybody I know from Orange County always has an opinion about the mouse in Disneyland in some kind of way, right? Uh, we all have a, a shared identity around things like Huntington Beach, you know, these kinds of things. And it gives us more to talk about. We feel as if we're closer with individuals. We share similar dialects, these kinds of things. And, and this is all just based around geographic closeness. Now, what's interesting is, is that they've even done these studies online. So they said, oh, okay, you're chatting with someone in an online setting who is geographically close to you. We do see that the same effect happens. So if I'm telling you that you're chatting with a completely random stranger, but you know that that person's from Mission Viejo, right? Or La Habra or something like that, somewhere geographically somewhat close to you, you're gonna have a higher likability score towards them in some kind of way. You know, so even when people are playing these large online, multi-online player games or whatever, whether it be you know, some multi-online uh, role-playing game or Counter-Strike or whatever, whatever the new Call of Duty or whatever that you folks are shooting each other up with, uh, that when you find your clan or your group of individuals that you game with, uh, there is some kind of interest, right, if they are from far away. But in the end, the people we tend to like more are the people who tend to live closer to us. It just always seems to be there psychologically. Now, when it comes to personal space, a lot of interesting studies on personal space, right? And uh, there will be some test questions about it. Now, for the most part, we tend to see that standing closer tends to facilitate compliance gain. So we'll have teachers that stand completely at the chalkboard versus teachers that tend to move up more towards the classroom, and we find that it increases their immediacy. Students tend to see that professors that move up closer tend to seem to feel a little more friendly, a little closer to the, uh, the class that's out there. Same thing's true with you know car salesmen. You know they tend to move up closer to you to facilitate compliance gaining. Uh, there's lots of situations where moving closer into somebody tends to enhance the persuasibility of a message. There's just more attention. There's more stimulus, right? But yes, it is true. You can get too close, which we'll discuss on the next slide. Now again, Segrid does another one of these meta-analysis of proximity studies and finds that the effect for closer proximity tends to be pretty much consistent. Close space uh, produces greater compliance than distant space. So if I'm trying to persuade you and I'm moving closer, you know, I'm moving up in the pulpit or closer to students in the classroom, there's more likability, tends to be more persuasibility. Now of course I'm not trying to run up and, and be on top of somebody inside of a desk, right? But uh, we, it tends to be that if I'm farther away, my message isn't going to be taken as powerfully as if I move in closer to you while I'm speaking to you. Now, this all comes with the caveat of different spatial zones. So, that same guy, Edward T. Hall, that we talked about, uh, has did a lot of research trying to figure out, well, at what point in time do we end up violating a person's space? And, and there's a lot of good research on this, but, and these zones tend to pretty much hold. Even when we go cross-culturally, they may move around a little bit. You know, some cultures a little bit more tolerant of people moving into their proxemic zone than other cultures that, hey man, give me my personal space. But for the most part, the rules tend to hold up pretty well. So if we go all the way out to 25 feet, right? So someone's 25 feet away from us, so going from the front to the back of a classroom or you know, going all the way to the, to the end of your probably, you know, I don't know, your living room probably if you have an attached dining area. When someone's 25 feet away from you, you tend to have to speak louder, right? You have to kind of yell, hey! You have to hail them in some kind of way to initiate conversation. So for most of us, public space tends to be that 12 to 25 foot range, right? So this is keeping a person far enough away that you don't have to interact with them if you don't want to, but this is usually where we make the decision whether or not we want to interact with someone. So think about it this way, you know, pre-COVID when you folks used to be able to walk around the streets, right? So, you know, you're walking down the street, you know, and you're going down the sidewalk and you see somebody kind of a little bit farther away, right? Let's say they're crazy, right? They're smoking two cigarettes and yelling at themselves, blah, 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 blah. Just cra a classically crazy person. You know, usually around 12 to 25 feet, that's where you make the decision, eh, I think I'm gonna cross the street, right? I'm not gonna deal with that person. Uh, now, in these public zones, we tend to make those kinds of uh, 
the, those kinds of decisions. I'm sure you folks have been, you know, back when you were on campus, maybe you saw that old buddy from high school that was kind of an acquaintance, didn't really like too much, but you would wave kind of thing, and then you see them, you know, halfway across the quad at 25 feet, and they look at you, and you're like, oh no, <laughs> get away from that conversation. Or maybe, hey, how's it going, right? And then you move in for a closer conversation. So at around 12 feet, this is where we're making the decision to communicate with another person. So 12 feet to 4 feet is kind of what we refer to as the social zone. So uh, this is where we tend to have conversations with acquaintances. So it pretty much goes back to an ancient rule, right, about how far you can, retro, uh, you can move your hands away. So in a social zone, you know, you're still outside of a fighting range, to tell you the truth, right? That, uh, that another person attacking you or you attacking another person, it would be too far enough away that you'd have enough time to prepare. So we tend to have social zone conversations with acquaintances, people that we don't know too much. Well, in this COVID era, everybody is social distancing with each other, right? But uh, the 4 to 12 feet usually is reserved for you know, business transactions, uh, people that we don't necessarily know too well, we're starting to get to know. This social zone, you know, uh, oftentimes we tend to get 4 feet uh, to people maybe, you know, eh, kind of standing in line about there, you know. Eh, I mean, maybe with line spaces we'll give people a little bit more room. But, you know, walking up and down aisles. And what's curious enough is even if you look at classrooms, uh, so if you take a look between the desks in any particular classroom, they're spaced almost exactly 4 feet apart give you that sort of comfort that nobody's really invading your personal space. You're still far enough away to have enough space to take notes and, and play with your cell phones like <laughs> you used to do back in the day. Uh, but you're not forced into anybody else's area, but, and you're still, of course, close enough that you can hear what's going on from another person that's next to you, maybe even pass a note. Now, moving in from the social zone, we have what we call the personal zone. So these, this is reserved for people that you do know, right? So these are friends, these are family members. Uh, these are, these are people that you don't mind. You know they're not going to attack you, so it's okay to stay within an arm's reach of them. So you're keeping them from about 18 inches or 1.5 feet up to about 4 feet. And, and this is probably the most negotiated kind of area, right? Because in some cultures, we see that the social zone kind of moves into the personal zone. That's why you feel like somebody's kind of violating you, usually when they get about 3 feet away from you. You're like, wait a second, that's my bubble, right? Are you trying to steal from me or something? You know, these kinds of things. Uh, but in your personal zone, that 4 feet to 1.5 feet is usually the areas that, you know, our, our parents, our good friends, these kinds of people. You're having close conversations with them. You're about an arm distance away. You can reach in for a touch if you want to, right? People can see your smiles, these kinds of things. But remember that even with our closest friends and family, it's usually we still give about 18 inches, you know, before we start to even feel violated with them. I don't know how many of you folks are still living at home with your parents, but if you have one of those like three-person couches, you know, I, I don't know if you folks are like me, but you know, you've got two family members that are sitting on the edge of the couch. You know, at what points in time is it okay to just jump on in the middle, right? Uh, you know, and it's interesting, right? If you're using an actual three-person couch for three feet. Uh, you know, oftentimes, some, you know, can be kind of either, maybe if your family's really close, it's no big deal. Maybe if your friends are really close, it's no big deal. But also, oftentimes, you know, you might be, eh, you know, I'll, I'll grab a little piece of floor space down here instead. Uh, because there's this notion of what we call intimate space. So the last zone, zero to 18 inches, right? So immediately up, you can smell a person, you know, you can see, you know, little flakes of stuff coming out of their mouth while you're talking to them. The intimate space of zero to 18 inches is almost always exclusively reserved for one person, your significant other. And oftentimes we do see that when we have long-term relationships, they consistently stay in each other's uh, intimate space. So this is why people will hold, uh, hold hands while walking in public. Or, oh man, I don't know what you folks think about this, but when, you, when we used to go into restaurants and you see the couple that are sitting on the same side of the booth, oh, so cute. Or, oh, I don't know, right? But, but definitely demonstrating to the world that they're inside of their intimate space. In nonverbal communication, we refer to these as tie signs or proxemic tie signs that when you are in public, by being less than 18 inches away from that person, you're signifying to the world that, in fact, the two of you are together in kinds of ways. And we see this all the time. I mean, even when you go down to the shopping market, right, you can see the couples that are close to each other pushing the cart together, these kinds of things. Because when we are inside of somebody else's intimate space and we've allowed that person to be in our intimate space, we tend to have them there for a very long time, and we use it as a way to signal it to the rest of the world. Remember for the exam, you folks will need to know these. So 25 feet to 12 feet is public space. 12 feet to 4 feet is social space. 
uh, four feet to one and a half feet or 18 inches is personal space. And then of course, 18 inches to zero or one and a half feet to zero is that intimate space that we only reserve for our significant other. So what happens when we violate these expectations, right? So uh, Judy Burgoon, uh, she's over at the University of Arizona, uh, one of the biggest names in nonverbal communication. Got to meet her actually when I was doing my paper at a conference. Uh, really interesting work on, well, what happens if you have these social barriers, right? These proxemic barriers and somebody violates them. So, you know, you're in a situation where you're talking to somebody while they're trying to sell you a car and they get up really close to you and they invade your intimate space, right? Uh, you know, it sets up a fight or flight kind of dy dynamic. Well, so she's wondering, well, is it possible for me to violate these things in a good way? So first she needs to take a look at the norms, right? So we all as individuals have social space expectations. Uh, we have touch, you know, e expectations. We have social space expectations. Nonverbal communication is really guided by a number of normative standards, right? These nomos, as Aristotle would call them, uh, standards that we've kind of been socialized into, but they're kind of more like unwritten laws. Uh, so, we do have expectations about what constitutes appropriate nonverbal behavior across all social situations. So, in these certain social situations, it's okay for people to get closer to each other. So, for example, if you were to go into an elevator, <laughs> I wonder how long it's going to be before we get to go into elevators again. But if we go into an elevator, uh, you know, you're allowed to kind of violate a person's social space. And, and curiously enough, there's a very complex set of etiquette about it, too. You'll notice that when People go into elevators, they stand in the farthest corners away from each other. So you know, maybe the first person goes in and presses a button. If there's somebody else in the elevator, you'll notice they go all the way to the opposite corner. The same is kind of true when you talk about desk space. So you have like one of those six person tables. Usually people tend to fill out in diagonals to give the most space towards other individuals. But we have you know, these very complex and oftentimes unwritten standards about how we allocate space to other individuals based around social situations and norms that we've been socialized into. Now, when we violate one of these, right, so we walk into the elevator and we stare at the back. <laughs> or we walk into the elevator and we stand right next to somebody, these kinds of things. Uh, they, tend to, they can be perceived as either positive or negative, depending upon the particular situation. So what she kind of anal uh, analyzes is, well, she says, well, well, if there's a position of status, right, so, you know, if a person has reward power and they choose to stand close to you in some kind of way and offer that kind of reward up, so we're much more likely to allow a person to invade our personal space if, we're, if we see them as likable, if we see them as powerful, if we see them as someone who might impart that power towards us. Uh, the second, of course, is the range of interpretations that can be assigned to that particular violation, right? So oftentimes, you know, this is where hand gestures and, and touch gestures come in because there can be so many multiple different interpretations of that particular violation. But if you can, tends to fall, you have a powerful person who tends to have a positive type of nonverbal uh, interaction with you, and you tend to perceive it as you tend to be a happy person, these can actually uh, stack up for each other and actually increase the amount of persuasibility by what we call a positive expectancy violation. So, you know, she did a lot of these studies where, like, you know, it's not just a handshake, but a handshake, a double handshake, an elbow grab, a hug, these kinds of things. Uh, that oftentimes there, there are scenarios in which nonverbal communication can have a positive effect through expectancy violations. But, you know, a lot of times, well, especially now in the COVID area, I'm pretty sure that any types of proxemic violations that move in are probably going to be interpreted in a very negative fashion, right? So the range of interpretations when we have to socially distance now, of course, are going to decrease. That any time I get anything closer than six feet to you, it's going to be kind of, oh, I'm kind of on a weird, uh, weird, weird world. <laughs> It would be so interesting to redo these studies when, when we can actually start interacting, but everybody still has to wear masks. Oh, I can't wait. I'm just sitting there with my clipboard, taking notes. <laughs> so that sort of covers proxemics. The big thing, of course, knowing halls for proxemic zones, right? That's where a lot of test questions are on. Uh, the next area that I want to talk about is what we call chronemics. Uh, so this is the study of time. Chronos is in a chronograph or a chronometer on your watch. Uh, what does time communicate? Well, this has been studied for a very long time <laughs> across the anthropology, sociology, and numbers of different historical contexts. Uh, time has communicative value. Yes, yes, right? I mean, no matter what, time, time is time, right? You're wasting my time. You're engaging my time. You're wondering how much longer or how much time do I have left on this lecture? 
Uh, time spent waiting oftentimes confers power and or status. Uh, for any of you folks that maybe have ever been part of the military, there's the infamous phrase, hurry up and wait, right? That they'll, they'll rush you as much as they can to dispose of your time and then make you wait uh, so you feel as if you're subordinate to another person that's out there. Same thing happens inside of high status power professions, right? So when you go to a doctor's office, even if the doctor's not doing anything, you know, they're still gonna make you wait. They're still gonna make you fill out paperwork. They're gonna make you fill out forms. There's always that aspect that if I confer time, that you're here by appointment and you're still gonna have to wait on my time, that's because I'm a powerful person like a doctor. Same thing happens with professors, right? I'm, one of the things you folks are, are, it's great that we're in an online framework because, <laughs> man, in real life, I am just the latest professor in the entire world. I don't know why. There's always something that seems to go wrong at the last minute here, right? But uh, professors and students, I'm sure you folks have probably got a story about a professor who either started class immediately on time and forced you to be there in your seats early, or that professor who always walked in kind of late, uh, perceiving that power that I can make you wait because even though you paid tuition for this class. Overall, um, most of the research does show, and again, Burgoon, you know, doing a lot of these studies inside of the world of nonverbal communication, is that tardiness tends to impact credibility. So, so sometimes making people wait uh, can, of course, confer power and or status, but it doesn't mean that people are going to like you very much afterwards. So even though you might be sitting down for the best doctor in the entire world, if he makes you wait two hours before you eventually see him or her, odds are it's going to negatively affect the type of interaction that you're going to have with them. So, uh, so most of her research showed that uh, people who arrived late to social gatherings were considered to be more dynamic, right? So, oh, hey, I'm energetic, I've got a lot, I'm coming in, but oftentimes still perceived as being less competent, less sociable uh, than those people that are punctual. So there's something about respecting another person's time that communicates something at a chronemic level. But this, of course, also has caveats, right? And then going back, there's another, a lot of other great research by that same guy, Edward T. Hall, the guy who came up with the proxemic zones. He also comes up with what we call P time and M time. So he's looking at how time is perceived across other cultures that are out there. And there are huge cultural differences in notions of time consciousness. So punctuality is very culturally constructed. You know, in American society, there is a very big demand for punctuality. We're, we tend to be on one of the higher ends, but there are other cultures out there that are very, very much more relaxed with their time. You know, how late can you be? I mean, even in Southern California, we have probably a little bit more of a, a gingerly attitude towards time. You know, we can always just say, hey, sorry, traffic was bad or something like that. Uh, though not right now in this COVID era, <laughs> but, uh, but we do have uh, issues of, of, of culture when it comes to notions of consciousness. And so what, uh, what Hall argues is that uh, across different cultures, we tend to have what we call polychronic time versus monochronic time. So he says that uh, polychronic time, where you sort of see your entire day as being determined by the, the, the tasks you have to do, but in no particular order, right? So you're poly polychronic, you, you know, not necessarily uh, completely multitasking, right? But the fact that you can have multiple things going on at the same time, and you kind of get to them as they go, you know, has a, much more of a polychronic kind of feel towards it, as opposed to a monochronic feel, where everything's laid out in very, you know, complete discretionary packets. Uh, you know, it's one of those interesting things that, you know, you have professors that have student office hours, or back when I was having office hours, you know, do you set up unique time windows that people can sign up for so you can give them a better organization of their time? Or do you just kind of let students come in and all sort of chat at the same time? You know, very polychronic versus monochronic kind of perspective. Uh, we do see, so, you know, the classic example, of course, is parties, right? So a party is a very polychronic kind of uh, situation. You know, you're never really sure who you're going to talk to first, how many people you're going to talk to, what kind of groups you're going to get into. And then looking at how polychronic the particular culture is determines how fashionably late you can show up to that actual party. And so we do find that some cultures showing up even five hours late to a party is still considered acceptable, you know, I'm kind of coming in and showing my power and status, whereas there are other cultures out there that if you're having a party, after five hours it's already over. Uh, from a monochronic perspective, you, met, you already met who you needed to meet, it's time to go kind of situation. So remember, of course, we got polychronic versus monochronic. Monochronic, it's compartmentalized. Test question about that one. Polychronic, we tend to see it as much more of a multitasking kind of way when dealing with numbers of individuals that are out there. 
Um, as we get towards the end of the lecture here, there are some other forms of nonverbal communication that aren't necessarily from humans, right? So not hand gestures, not body movements, not eye contact, not you know, facial expressions, but rather material objects that are outside of ourselves too that convey certain communicative principles. So material objects oftentimes are seen as extensions of the self. So again, this is a lot of research that's done by Hall as well in the territorial imperative. So oftentimes when we have material objects and we set them down somewhere, people know that you've laid ownership to that particular area, right? So if I was to come in and grab my scarf and throw it up on a particular table, I'm essentially claiming that area as mine. And you folks have probably seen this too back in the days when we <laughs> used to actually uh, be able to go to parks and, and have picnics in places. Usually you probably had one member of your family who went down to the park at like 7 in the morning to stand over the table or start putting down, you know, uh, different coolers or, you know, put down the steaks or the barbecue briskets or all those kinds of things uh, to show those material objects as being extensions of yourself that you, in fact, are reserving that area for your particular uh, party that you're going to have later on. Also, a lot of interesting research done on uniforms with regards to compliance gaining. So, a person wearing, you know, an officer wearing a uniform conveys a certain level of respect and deference just by function of the uniform in and of itself. So, uh, Lawrence and Watson in '91, of course, did uh, did some some interesting research on the old uh, on the people that used to ring the bells, the uh, the Salvation Army people. So. So they were trying to figure out, you know, if I do wear the Salvation Army uniform and ring the bell, do I actually get higher tips? And they found out that, in fact, yes, you do. Uh, same holds true for people that are collecting donations for fire departments, right? So if you've got firemen all dressed up in their fire gear, right, you're more likely to give them more money. Uh, than, or if you have officers that are dressed up in their gear while asking for funds. Uh, people wearing uniforms tend to convey that power and status and respect, and people tend to, they tend to come forward, even in the amount of... Uh, uh, donations and contributions that people give. Uh, change. So back in the days of phone booths, <laughs> back before most of you folks were born, uh, Brigman in, in 1971 uh, did some research where you know they tried to you know people would leave change in the phone booth, and you know a lot of nice people would say, oh excuse me sir, you know you left your change in there because there used to be lines for phone booths back in the day, and so they did one of these studies right where they had Confederates dressed up and they would leave some change in the phone booth and see if somebody else would come back and ask and say, excuse me sir, you know you left your 50 cents inside of the phone booth. Back when 50 cents could actually get you something. Oh, man. Back when I started smoking cigarettes, man, I'm telling you, a buck 50. A buck 50 a pack, man, I'm telling you. Woo. Don't worry. We'll be getting out of here so I can have one of these soon. Uh, but well-dressed people, of course, 77% uh, of the time people would say, oh, excuse me, sir, or excuse me, ma'am, you left your change inside of the, the phone booth. Uh, poorly dressed people, though, only 38% of the time. So there's something to be said for even dressing up in a particular area. Clothing, of course, signifies that status. It signifies that authority. Now, you know, of course, I've said time and time again, you don't need to dress up for any speeches in this class, but the research really is strong out there. The nonverbal communication from a well-dressed individual carries a lot more status, a lot more authority. So when you're out there in the real world and you're going for those job interviews or you're going to give that delivery in front of a larger group of individuals, truly, dressing up is something that's more powerful. Uh, with regards to your uh, your persuasibility towards other individuals. Uh, classic shoplifting studies, uh, I thought these were pretty good, right? So shoppers were less likely to report a well-dressed shoplifter than a casually dressed or even a poorly dressed shoplifter. So if a person's wearing a suit and tie and walking through a store, 90% of the time they would not report that person shoplifting a goods and services from that. You know, maybe they assume that the person worked there. Maybe they assume that the person, like, why is he doing that? You know, or why is she doing that? But if you're wearing a suit and tie, 90% of people, individuals did not report prison shoplifting. However, if you were just wearing clean jeans, a t-shirt, jacket, maybe some moccasins, 63% of the time people still didn't report you. But if you look slovenly, if you look the part of a person who would shoplift, right? quote unquote, that grungy individual, right? Dirty jeans, a torn jacket, sneakers, 60% of people did not report. So we do see that clothes, in fact, have a 30% difference with regards to reporting of criminal behaviors. So if you're ever gonna shoplift, make sure you're dressed well when you do it. Uh, we also kind of find, and, and finally sort of end this all off, is uh, lots of nonverbal communication dealing with what we call in psychology called the halo effect or the horn effect. So a lot of research done on attractiveness and social influence. You know, whenever I'm sitting back talking to my buddies who are professors, you know, we always you know, ruminate about the days, but remember back when we were grad students and we were young and sexy and, and everybody loved us. We used to get, you know, lots of chili peppers on our great my professors. 
Uh, lots of studies, of course, show that if you are attracted, that halo effect tends to work very well for you, right? So the relationship between attractiveness and criminal sentencing is probably one of the biggest areas that we've seen, that handsome defendants were twice as likely to avoid a jail sentence. So if you're good looking, you know, I, you just, you're way more likely to avoid jail sentences or harsher punishments inside of the court. So I always kind of wonder about that Martin Shkreli guy, right? You know, it's just like, if he actually kind of looked a little more bro or a little bit, you know, he's just on that brink, maybe he wouldn't have gotten necessarily punished as bad. Who knows though, right? Uh, Benson, Sarabek, and Lerner in 1976 found that both sexes were more likely to comply with a request for assistance from if the requester was attractive. So, you know, even if you're, if you're a male and there's an attractive male asking you for something, hey man, can I borrow this? Or, hey, can you mind helping me out with this? Still an increased halo effect for that type of situation. Same thing with attractive females and with, attractive, uh, with other females that are out there. But there is research that shows that there is a cross-gender effect. So, you know, if you're a female and you have an attractive male professor, you're more likely to perceive information and retain information from that person, and of course vice versa, right? Guys are more likely to learn and retain information from attractive female professors. So at least I'm working okay for about half the class, right? <laughs> but overall, just attractiveness tends to work out better. And that takes us to the end of nonverbal communication. So this is the step out of chapter five. Remember, remember your ics, right? So haptics, proxemics, oculics, kinesics, all these ics will be on the exam. Remember your social distancing spaces inside of chronemics, notions of P time versus N time, M time, inside of hand gestures, issues like what is an emblematic hand gesture that has a universal, well, or a culturally specific, but direct verbal message versus an illustrator, which accompanies a message, versus an adapter, which may be just showing off a particular feeling at a particular time. Till next time, see you soon.